Okay, class. How many of you have heard of George Washington, first president of the United States? Good. How many of you have heard of Captain Meriwether Lewis of Virginia? What about Captain William Clark of Kentucky? Very good. How about the Lewis and Clark expedition? Oh, beautiful. How many of you have heard of York? Anybody care to guess? Okay, I'll give you a hint. He was a member of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Okay, today class, we're going to find out who York was. What he did, what happened, where it happened, and why? York was a black man. He was probably just an average black man for the times, except for his height, his size, and strength. He was average, about like myself. However, York was a servant. He was born in Kentucky, the property of the Clark family and he was owned by Captain William Clark. They grew up together as children. They played together. And York grew up to be the servant of William Clark. As a servant, it was York's unquestionable duty to serve his master, Captain Clark, and was thereby taken along as a member of the Lewis and Clark expedition. He was the first known black man to visit a great many places along the Missouri. And although history doesn't record him as being a hero of the frontier, it is fact enough that he was there. The Missouri River is the longest river on the continent of the United States. Now its closest rival, the Mackenzie and the Mississippi, are each almost 500 miles shy of its sprawling, twisting length. And its far-flung watershed constituted the heart of the empire known as the Louisiana Territory. The continuing flow of its waters were like the persistent dreaming of Thomas Jefferson, who was possessed with the visions that his dream of Western exploration would be a public venture, of proper size and with sure and suitable backing. So for the purpose of extending the external commerce of the United States, the Congress appropriated the money for the exploration. On July 4th, 1803, Thomas Jefferson, President of the United States, spent the evening detailing his concern to know of the many factors converging on the new frontier of the American West. He had already offered to his private secretary and young friend, Captain Meriwether Lewis, the magnificent venture of Western exploration. With Jefferson's permission, Lewis had written his friend, Captain William Clark, the younger brother of the famous George Rogers Clark, of an earlier exploration proposed by Jefferson, to share in the adventure and the command of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Jefferson's instructions to Lewis were most elaborately and thoroughly thought out. The object of your mission is to explore the Missouri River and such principal stream of it as by its course and communication with the waters of the Pacific Ocean that may offer the most direct and practicable water communication across this continent for the purpose of commerce. Inform yourself of the circumstances which may decide whether the furs of those parts may not be collected as advantageously at the head of the Missouri as at Nootka Sound or any other point of that coast. March 10, 1804, Upper Louisiana was transferred from Spain to France and then to the United States. In a ceremony at St. Louis, Captain Meriwether Lewis was an official witness for the United States just two months before he and Clark would embark on their expedition.
It's wide open country. Plenty game. And it's free. Still plenty of time to make good progress inland, William. We'll wait here. Rest here before moving on. Uh, Let the others catch up, huh? Uh, yeah. How's that feel? Oh, good. Ooh. I patted the straps to make sure they don't cut in. Uh, you know, it seems to me the way y'all be collecting all these rocks and things. A pack of rock is gonna weigh over 400 pounds by the time we're through. <laughs> we have the finest collection of rocks and fruits. Berries and bones of any expedition yeah. in the entire world. Smart! Double turn! The Lewis and Clark expedition was realized by everyone in the party to be such a historic journey that almost everybody kept a diary. And no matter how tired or cold, or hungry they got, or no matter what the weather, rain or snow or baking heat, the day's events were set down as each man saw them. Much of the diaries which told the day-by-day -day events would be a droning of boring pinpricks. They were factual, but would read like the accounts of the days of counted game and birds and soil or rain, or about the sky the river, and the sights of the endless foliage along its banks. The stories, like the past, would lead wearily through the thicket, and on, and on, up the big muddy, make treks inland to hunt and explore, and charting the vast wilderness of the West. The river is 15 feet across at this point, and then proceeds to a jetty, where it turns at a right angle and creates rapid. There is a small bay nearby. Across the bank, there is 150 yards of shoreline. circuits that would freshen the day's adventure and break the monotony of the main duty of the exploration. It was almost a feeling of being set free to wander off to hunt. 
While Lewis went by canoe to supervise and direct the progress of their boats, Clark's party would push inland to hunt. On these jaunts, Lewis commonly went alone. Captain Clark, Pryor and Crusat would form a team to fish. At one point along the Missouri, they caught 318 fish in just over an hour. York, Gibson, and Shannon set off in another direction to hunt. First, it was just another day on the Big Muddy. But soon the river increased the speed of its moving body, and then it became mean. Like it was noting a crime that may have been committed by one of the members of the party. Now and then, the Indians would watch from the shoreline. They had set out early and had not proceeded far when the canoe wheeled on a soil which was near injuring. The river was rising very swiftly. It passed between two islands, a very bad place with moving sands. They were nearly being swallowed up by the rolling sands of which the current was so strong. They were compelled to pass into a bank, then dashed into the rapids again and tossed into a fallen tree. Hey! Whoa! Get the stern around, they had passed through land emptied of its native inhabitants and had only seen traces of villages no longer occupied by Indians. Lewis was anxiously awaiting the moment when he could meet with some chiefs of that nation to let them know of the change in government and the wishes of our government to cultivate friendship with them, explain the objectives of our journey, and to present them with a flag and some small presents. In this first official meeting between the Plain Indians and the Lewis and Clark party, there is a reminder of Balboa impressing his Indian father-in-law by parading before him the power and wealth of the white man. want to be welcome in your land. Beads, wampum. Grass beads, wampum. We, we come in peace. Gift. 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 We bring gifts. Wampum. Wampum. Uh, many blankets. Tobacco. Captain, he he's happen. looking at York. York. Let me come in Offer him your hand. Uh, let me know that you're a person, that you're humor. 
We bring you York. Servant to Captain Clark. Friend. small presents for those people in proportion to their consequence. A first grade medal would be presented to a chief, a second grade, and a third grade medal for lower ranking Indians. On this 21st day, O Lord of September, and of the year 1804, by the powers invested in me, by and for these United States, I bid to you the welcome of the hand of friendship, and in peace, and may this cause of friendship in the advent of expression. The speech to the Indian nation was to express the purpose and wishes of the government as set forth by the President of the United States of America. Advice was given to them and directions of how they were to conduct themselves henceforth. The Indians accepted this treaty along with the medals and gifts in unquestionable good faith. In reply, the chief answered with a speech. He promised to follow the advice given and declared himself happy to know that his new fathers were men who could be depended on. They then were given canisters of powder and a jug of whiskey the traditional American symbol of trade and friendship. It was not the gifts or speeches, nor the whiskey or guns that were fired for the astonishment of the Indians, nor was it the goods bestowed for their pleasure and goodwill. The event that would mark this day as the most impressive and mysterious happening to remember and was so unusually large and different that it was called Big Medicine. <laughs> <laughs> it was the cause of the greatest doer among the Indians. It was Captain Clark's servant, York. Despite hunger, accidents, sickness, fatigue, and the miseries of the forced marches of Lewis, they were able to remember the scientific inquiries he had been requested to pursue. They noted the quality of the soil, the nature of the rock formations, the honeysuckle, and an account of flying things. It wasn't as adventurous as a soldier's dream but it was most important. On the morning of August 12th, 1805, a hunting party was put ashore from a canoe. Captain Lewis, York, 
Sergeant Gass, and Peter Croissant were to procure as much meat as they could carry to resupply their stock of rations. I think we'll have elk tonight, Captain. A group of them just watered here. Choose your territories, gentlemen. The hunt has begun. That Crusat was a fine waterman, but as was said more than once, he is nearsighted and has but the use of one eye. The wound was disconcerting. But the story Lewis would have to tell and explain how he thought it was Indians would be more so. But then, he would be well in 20 to 30 days. It's evening, and the smell of coffee, salt pork with honey biscuits, beckons to the party at the end of a long day. At night, when all would come together again, there would be stories and news to exchange. If the weather had been chilling, grog would be issued to each man. They often hoped for a slight chilling in the air. At camp, it was Peter Crusat who was nearsighted and had the use of but one eye. He held the attention of all, dramatizing the part he played in that day's events. He enjoyed demonstrating his ability whenever he could. <laughs> Delightful land. It was a delightful day. I feel tomorrow would be a profitable day to hunt and fish. As I was saying, I did not want to make a sound. I waited for the opportunity. I knew the bear would turn and I would get a shot here, between the eyes. So, I waited for the monstrous bear to turn, but he would not turn. So I hollered to the bear, Monsieur Bear! But he would not turn. So I holler the name three times, Monsieur Bear, and he does not turn. Then I pick up a big rock and I throw it. The bear turns and I shoot. And the bear, he comes at me fast. So I ran. But the shot hit him. This I am sure of. Then who killed him? Let your tell yeah, it. Tell yeah, tell yeah, yeah. We rushed to land the canoes. It was decided that two should hold their fire, in case of a miss by Crusat and myself. We spread along the concealment of a small hill, crawling real low. We came as close as 40 paces, and then we fired simultaneously. Two bullets struck the bear through the lungs right here. And then the bear charged us like this. Yeah. He did it, yes! But the two men held in reserve, discharged their weapons, and they hit him twice. Both bullets struck one slightly near the ribs. The other hit him in the shoulder and shook him hard. Breaking his shoulder. But he hardly slowed. Unable to reload our guns for a second round, we immediately took to flight. That hurly burly came a breathing down my neck fast. It very nearly overtook us before we got to the river. Shannon and Gibson betook themselves a canoe. Boss, me and Crusat took company in the ducks of the willows, where we were able to reload our guns and take cautious aim. We had the opportunity to strike that bear several times. He then turned. He then turned. Ah! This is our who turned and threw away his gun in a hurry. I on him And that really made him mad. The race between us got to be so close that I was obliged to throw away my gun and dive into the river after Cruzat. The bank would rise 20 feet off the water. That animal was so enraged, so dad blame enraged, that he plunged into the river only a few feet behind us. Shannon and Gibson turned back to the lower bank and run ashore and finally fired the shots that we think hit him in the head and finally killed him. We found him eight bullets at fast stream in different directions. An exciting day in the diary, sir. Mr. Kanda, is that all true? 
Yes, it is. It is all fact. It's documented by the ledgers and the diaries of the men that were on the expedition, and they're located in the Library of Congress. With the flag caught in the breeze of another day, the Lewis and Clark expedition marches along the banks of the Missouri River to the end of their exploration. The men and women that pioneered this country all have one thing in common. It is not the adventurous spirit, nor the drive that makes one man more outstanding than the next, nor is it wealth or skill or ambitious pride or fame part in life that is necessary to be considered a pioneer is to be present when the event occurs.